Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I am absolutely excited to be sitting here with Asher Janut, the CEO and co-founder at US Bitcoin Core. Asher, welcome to the show. Thanks. President and co-founder. But president. Thanks. President. <laughs> All good. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Oh, All good. boy. Just, uh, just butcher the start, huh, Asher? <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, it's it's good to see you. I'm really glad we were able to get you on the show. Um, got to bump into you down at uh, Pacific Bitcoin for just a second. I think you were only there for you were only there in and out, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Did you? Uh, I don't know. Did you stick around? There were quite a few mining companies there. I there were a lot of a lot of familiar faces, good friends. So said hi to everyone. Um, I had another event I was uh, in town for as well. So was trying to balance the two. But no, it's it great to see everyone in that environment. Is great. It's a small event where um, it's pretty close to it. So it was a fun time. It was. It what was fun about it for me is it it was like a conference. I know it was a festival, but it was it was pretty laid back as far as like expectations at the at the festival so that that was a little bit more fun to have kind of that laid back vibe um cool well yeah like i guess it was fun to to bump into you there and a lot of a lot of big industry names at that event um so that was that was fun so asher the way i like to kind of start these these episodes off is i i really like to hear people's backgrounds i think it's really interesting and it helps us kind of understand where you're coming from to hear your background and then like what what got you into bitcoin mining yeah uh so parents immigrated to the u.s uh was born and raised here and kind of grew up with a ton of support um kind of but really had this entrepreneurial background right they immigrated here they kind of worked and built their own uh kind of small businesses and so I had graduated college at an early age when I was 19, ended up, was planning on going into kind of the investment management world and just realized that I wanted to build things and I didn't want to sit behind a computer and like analyze other people and like assess other people building companies and, and such. And so sure. I convinced my dean and convinced my parents to let me go on this trip where it was like in, um, it was uh, Israel, China, India, and Nigeria. And the idea was go and kind of work in all these places and understand a better perspective of the world, the problems that people face, the perspectives that people have, and see what I could build that could make an impact. Um, so I built up a company out in Shanghai for about five years. And when I had sold that company and was relocated to the States for more kind of personal reasons, getting more serious with my now fiance and said, you know what, I want to have kids and a family back in the US with my friends and family. Um, so I ended up selling that business, moving stateside and my, uh, Mike, my co-founder, I've known him since we were, I don't know, 17, 16, 17 years old. We met at a Peter Thiel fellowship. He basically has this program called the Thiel fellowship that would pay college kids to drop out of school and start a business. Oh, wow. Um, cool. Yeah. It was really cool. We both kind of made it to, uh, those final rounds and then my parents were like, you're the first one to go to college in our family. You're not dropping out. You're finishing this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So ended up meeting really great kind of friends through the experience. But when we came back, his foray into the sector was back in like 14 and 15, started mining more as a hobbyist. And we have another person on our team, Carl, who's kind of mined one of the first kind of 100 blocks of Ethereum. And it was just, he, oh, wow. they started mining back when you can still use GPU servers, right? And you can kind of zip tie them to a milk carton and plug them in. And so he had built a successful kind of business beforehand and um, had the capital person kind of invest in mining and saw it as an interesting opportunity. And then kind of fast forward to 16 and 17, started building a lot of assets that public companies ended up buying because a lot of public companies saw Hive go public and they're trading at like $2 billion with two megawatts. And everyone's like, how do I build these facilities? How do I scale them? And at the time, the manufacturers didn't like Irene, this was like when she first joined. So like she was the first like English speaking person at Bitmain pre that like, yeah, we'll just have to buy machines online. Right. And so yeah. uh, basically a lot of that moment in time, the opportunity he saw was like, let's just sell picks and shovels and build the infrastructure to help sell machines because the machines are advancing at such a rapid rate. Whereas in now, like with Moore's law, you see every efficiency increase being a lot more conservative compared to back in kind of 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, and so, when we started the business, there's really like three 
big trends and kind of hypothesis theses that we had um, that converged. The first was just Bitcoin as like a digital store of value. We were going, we were living in a COVID era where everyone was online, everyone was on Zoom. And I just like think about my parents and I'm like, for them to understand crypto and digital assets, like was a hard kind of thing to yeah. just grasp and understand. Um, and Mine so, still don't get it, by the way. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so yeah. like when we were going into this digital world, they're like, oh, the whole world is becoming digital. And then it's like, hey, there's this digital gold. Like I, yeah. I, the idea of like, I think individuals picking up that concept and trusting it when the whole world is shifting, we felt like it was kind of a really big event. And then obviously there starts to be early adoption on the institutional side in 2022, 2020 as well. Um, so that was kind of the first thing is just a belief in the underlying obviously asset that we get paid with. Um, the second was the kind of plateau and Moore's law, as I mentioned, you're going from kind of the seven, five, three, now two nanometer chips, and you're just seeing less efficient. So really being able to deploy capital at scale and being able to depreciate it over a longer period of time. Yep. Uh, and then lastly, and like this was one of my biggest drivers, honestly, was just the energy element of things. I When I look at kind of just the world and the US specifically, you have all of this renewable and primarily wind and solar being built. And historically, kind of our grid has been pretty base low power, right? With coal, natural gas, nuclear, hydro. And basically, like wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. And so you have the, all this intermittent load happening that is creating like grid instability, right? Yep. Um, and at the same time, most of these assets are built kind of in the middle of nowhere um, in West Texas, et cetera. And when I say middle of nowhere, I mean not in heavy metropolitan areas where there's heavy yep. demand. And the transmission systems are just not built to actually transport all that energy right now. And so, and a lot of that is driven because of like the tax credits and people just wanting to build because there's production tax credits and investment tax credits and there's no load to consume. So what you inevitably are seeing right now is a ton of congestion risks, um, congestion, nodal kind of congestion. And then you're seeing a lot of curtailment on these sites. Um, and so the thought process was, Bitcoin mining data centers and kind of digital asset infrastructure is really interesting because unlike anything else that uses power, the read is really an, the the need is really just an economic. When you, you consume the power, you make Bitcoin. When you don't, you don't. Right? It it isn't. I need to use energy to produce this product, or I need to use energy to power this home, to power this data center that powers this business that needs twenty four seven access. It's. Yep. We can be online or we can be offline. And really, it's just an economic decision. And that was really fascinating in the ability to kind of, one, bring these assets anywhere. Like we have a site in West Texas that's running on Starlinks, right? Like, so you yeah. don't even need yep. fiber there. And then two is the ability to really work with energy companies in the long term and help solve that problem of nodal congestion and help with that curtailment, giving kind of them a baseload consumption directly at the source of generation uh, rather than them having to transport the power to the local hub, losing slippage there and so forth. So that was really the drive. And then we started building, uh, we lived on site. We basically, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I lived in Niagara Falls, New York for almost a year. Um, and most of the folks on our kind of leadership team did, I, I don't know, our, our belief was like, if we really want to understand how to build and scale this business, you've got to just understand the weeds of the business and you got to understand, like, if you want an amazing facility, you got to understand the folks that work at your sites, how they think about the world, like the issues that they face. And so that's where we started building our own software because we were, this was like kind of preform and where it was like BTC tools and you would have to mm -hmm. go refresh and you would wait forever on a couple thousand machines for the thing to refresh. And then you'd go and say, okay, this machine's broken. How do I go find it? And so we started saying, okay, yeah. these don't make sense. Let's go in and invest money and go and build tools that can operate at scale. And so I think for us, like in 2021, the things that we did well were we like built the right foundation because we were always focused on like, okay, we're managing one, 2000 machines. What does this look like when we're managing tens of thousands or mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands or millions? Like what, what does that look like? And so started focusing on that early on. And at the time, I mean, everyone really just cared about growth, right? Everyone had like 90% margins and no one really cared about the optimization, the efficiencies. Um, so obviously 
market and everyone, including ourselves, went through like a tough 2022, right? Like every other month was like more bad news, more bad news, more bad news. That, um, yeah, it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was that was a tough time. That was a hard time. Um, and luckily kind of made it through that period of time. And then we, be, I think because we started being able to operate well and just had kind of right opportunity to show up at the right time, um, ended up acquiring assets, building out two other business verticals on like co-location business and property management business. And so today, post uh, the Celsius deal, which is very public and it's kind of out out there with the assets that we'll manage uh, in that transaction, if we kind of get through to the finish line, will be over 1,100 megawatts, right? So almost 1.1 gigawatts of capacity, uh, over 400,000 machines under management. Um, and so we're super excited. I think we've been very privileged and lucky to have these opportunities and be able to grow and have an amazing team that has been able to execute and really scale. I love that. Um, all of that. And there, there was a lot in there that, that we're, we're going to kind of circle back to and, and kind of go, uh, you know, a little, little bit deeper on, um, what I love is that it was, you know, it's kind of the same thing for me was after spending some time looking at all of this Bitcoin mining, eventually I ended up <clears throat> at a point where it's like, this is going to end up as upstream as it can possibly get for, for all the reasons you just laid out is like, why Bitcoin mining is is so impactful on a on a grid system that it's on. So I, I love that. Thank you, Asher. And it's it's good to hear kind of where you're coming from. I think it's uh it's a it's a bit unique that you guys in the leadership team were like living on site and and really in the weeds on uh you know how to scale that operation. So that it was it's fantastic to hear all that. You kind of ended with, you know, maybe where I want to go right, right, you know, right away or, or next is you guys have some business verticals that I don't think are super well known. Can you touch on like, what are your revenue streams? What are your verticals? Like what else other than mining are you guys doing? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because we've had a lot of conversations. We're going through this public merger transaction now. And we've had a lot of conversations where I think if you look at 2021, People, all they cared about was like name, place, exit hash. How many contracts did you get? How big are you going? Yep. And I think in 2022, many folks started realizing like, just because you got a contract doesn't mean that you actually could finish the financing of it. You could actually build it. And most importantly, you could actually operate the thing well, right? So then operational reports started becoming a thing. And it was like Bitcoin production reports monthly. And it's like, how many Bitcoin do you produce? Mm -hmm. And I think the industry has evolved and become more sophisticated where different people make money in different ways. Right. There are folks that just mine Bitcoin and that's really all they do. There are other folks that sell energy during the hot summer months and they curtail, but it's way more profitable to sell the electricity that they have on their heads than it is to mine Bitcoin. And so when you just look at how many Bitcoin do they mine, that's not a fair representation of how strong the company is financially and yeah. how they're growing. Right. I think the diversification, like the biggest thing I, I learned in 2022 is You've got to, if you're going to play in the space and play in the long term, you've got to figure out how to diversify where you have a strong floor and you can kind of survive through the bear markets, but you structure everything where you can capture upside when the markets really run and you're in a bull cycle. And so we spent a lot of time basically diversifying our business and saying, okay, like at our core, what do we want to be and who are we? And yeah. where we landed was we want to be an infrastructure company that in the kind of next gen infrastructure company. And we want to just be at the center of energy and data, whatever kind of that use of that data is. And so today within kind of our Bitcoin mining business segment, we have three pieces, right? We have where we started, which is self mining. We own facilities, we own machines, we self mine, we have exposure to Bitcoin, hash price and so forth. The second business vertical that really came out, out of kind of the last year or so is basically building an institutional service provider. So an institutional property management business service provider that does everything from greenfield, building facilities, operating facilities, bringing customers in if people want a hosting model, managing their self-mining fleet if that's what they want, optimizing, helping with the energy trading strategy, the curtailment, um, the accounting. We do like audited financials for our partners and run the whole books for them legal, so on and so forth. So kind oh, of a wow. turnkey solution for folks who want exposure to the space to not actually have to know much about 
actually operating these facilities. Because I think that's one thing that we really saw over the last couple of years. A lot of folks wanted exposure to this asset class. And it was just really hard for many companies to be able to scale and execute and kind of fulfill on the promises that were made. And so at the scale that we have today, I think for us to bring on a site, one, 200 megawatts is relatively like kind of, we have a structure in place. It, it's not a big lift for us. And so for someone to go and build a hundred from scratch, I mean, there's a lot of learning and a lot of mistakes we made along the way that have gone to us to where we are today. And so I think for someone who wants exposure to the space, the idea is you can invest in a site and then hire us to come and build. And ideally what you pay us is less than what you would have done building the whole thing yourself and operating it yourself anyways, because we've gone so many okay. economies of scale and driven costs yeah. down so much across the site. And so the second is uh, the property management business, which is a pretty large part um, of our kind of financials on a go forward basis. And then lastly is co-location business. So we have our site that we own that there was a public announcement where we're hosting some Celsius machines as we're kind of mm -hmm. helping them build out their uh, structure, their self-mining facilities and such. And then also we acquired a 50% stake in the joint venture um, at the King Mountain facility in the Compute North bankruptcy, where we have a large uh, publicly traded miner that kind of hosts at that facility as well. So the third sector is co-location hosting, where we host other people's machines that are our infrastructure. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, again, it's just being able to to see all of the pieces to your business. I think you know, it's it's. I like the diversification, you know, whether that's either, you know, the power hedging strategy or like what you guys are doing where it's breaking into other support verticals, the picks and axes and that, that sort of thing, property management. Um, and they're real. I mean, yeah. we're talking about like tens and tens of millions of dollars of EBITDA. They're like real business verticals that have scaled. Right. And that I think is super important because that's contracted revenue where even if Bitcoin goes down or hash price goes down or the halving happens, we still get paid that amount to be able. Mm -hmm. So just on that, those business segments, we can run our whole business, right? And so those are contracted revenues that we get no matter what. So when I think about the floor, we'll never be in a scenario where it's like, okay, the markets are so bearish. We, we have to let go of people. We have to fire people, et cetera. It's like, no, right. we can cover and we can continue to operate. And then we get that upside exposure in our exposure to our fleet. So when the markets really run, we get up and are able to capture all of that upside as well. And then ideally with the cash flows that we get in more bearish markets, we can use that cash to reinvest into the industry. And I really think like it, it's counterintuitive, but most people deploy capital in the space when the market is ripping and yes. <laughs> many people run away when it's a bearish cycle. And I mean, if you want to build now, it's the cheapest time to build, right? Like everything's cheap. And so I think being able to have the cash to reinvest, to build and to grow um, is, is important. Hugely, hugely important. It leads really nicely, Asher, into to another like piece I wanted to kind of dive into a little bit more was you guys were pretty big winners when there was blood in the streets. Um, there were some bankruptcies, some very public ones. I'm in Minnesota. I was next door to one of them. Um, I'd love for you to maybe kind of go into the story of like how you guys were able to capitalize on that and maybe you know, from there, I'm going to ask you some questions about the energy sure. side of that, because um, yeah. that, that, that's I think we're both pretty interested in that. But walk us through, like, how, how were you guys able to capitalize, you know, when everyone was panicking? Yeah. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. We were panicking, too. Right. The market was a bad, <laughs> yeah, bad was state. Um, and it, again, at the end of the day, this business like many businesses about the people, how strong is your team to be able to execute? How much diversity do you have in talent and expertise? And I think we really focused on building the right foundation, the right principles. So when we went into this kind of piece, and so we went from literally like 86 megawatts under management to over a thousand in like a year. Um, and our sites now are operating very well. Um, it was like a rough patch to take them on and to make them more efficient. Cause like, for example, the one that the, bankruptcy that you mentioned in Minnesota. I mean, most of their sites were basically neglected for a year because they were distressed and in bankruptcy and there wasn't capital to actually fix issues. So when we came on board, like there were the sites that were already operating and then there were the sites that were being built in bankruptcy. Yeah. And it was just like, there was so much we had to do to kind of overcome that hurdle and to clean it up and fix the infrastructure, the networking, so on and so forth. Right. So there was a lot, but I mean, we had the team, we had the folks that 
like rolled up their sleeves and said, let's go, let's build this, let's do it. Um, and I think like, so that's from an operational perspective, uh, couldn't have done this without kind of the, the folks that we have on our team and what they were able to do to be able to scale and build the proper systems. I mean, we had an audit check where they came and checked inventory the other day and they said out of all of the companies that they audited, we were the one that passed the most because we knew where every single piece of equipment was. But again, with all the software we created around, operations, mm -hmm. inventory managers, energy trading. And so like really un grasping the business and allowing that to scale. Um, but in terms of like more from a deal structuring perspective, we were restructuring our debt simultaneously, um, kind of learning and sitting um, and getting exposure to kind of the Minnesota bankruptcy on the compute north side that you mentioned. Yeah. And I think like, look, we, 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 we did compute north, we're in Celsius now. And I think the, the real thing is like, Bankruptcy is its own world. And in traditional industries, you have kind of distressed investors or lenders that come in when that time comes. Where in this sector, like what I saw was a lot of those traditional distressed experts had no thesis on crypto. And so they weren't around the table yeah. to like come and buy these assets at uh, prices. And so, and then the crypto folks were like, well, bankruptcy, that's like way too convoluted. Like I'm going to stay away from that, right? There's like way too much going on there. Um, and so uh, yeah. we just kind of, Dove in um, and then I think found an opportunity. So on the computer side, like we acquired an asset, um, the energy company uh, that basically ha ha had the joint venture with them. We had been discussion with them for a long time. So there was a kind of background rapport and we basically acquired that asset there. And then when the when Generate kind of credit bid and took over their sites, like they lent money never thinking there that they would own and operate a Bitcoin mining facility, right? Yeah. And so exactly. We reached out and we were, just, we were just like, hey, how can we help? And then kind of that was the origination of this whole business of like, hey, can you actually come and run this for us? Because we were investors and that was our exposure. Um, and Celsius is a whole beast of itself. But I don't know. I think Celsius is interesting because it's one of those bankruptcies where, I mean, you don't really have secured creditors classes, also unsecured creditors and primarily kind of a retail base and, and audience and creditor group. And I just think like, if you were to liquidate all the assets in that estate, I mean, you know, more than most, like if you're going to go and liquidate a hundred thousand machines, like you're not getting much for them, right? Like the value there, there's no, like, I don't think the depth in the market is there, nor like will people be paying much, even if they had the money. Um, and so I think yeah. an opportunity to go and build a new business from some of the liquid assets, distributing as much of the liquid assets as you can and building a new business, creating equity value, like, there's the business opportunity on one side for us to be able to scale and, and such. But after meeting a lot of the folks who kind of were affected by this bankruptcy, I think there's a real opportunity to like build a great business and like do good and um, kind of help the ecosystem. I think when we formed Fahrenheit, I was sitting with Mike Harrington from Harrington Capital, and then we had Steve Kokinos and Robbie Kaza and Noah Jessup. And one of the big drivers was like, if another one of these just completely goes down, like, there's already such like, I feel like in 2021, it was this like moment in time where people were like, crypto is finally being institutional, like big yep. folks are investing, they're getting involved, yep. these big brands, Celsius, FTX, Voyager were being built and them going under was a massive influence and massive impact on the world, right? And that was very, very important. Yeah, so I, I think it's the ability to make an impact and the ability to like add value aside from just, hey, we're going to build a business, we're going to bring on a customer and we're going to grow. But like, I think at a certain point as a business, you think about how do we continue to grow for our shareholders and generate returns and generate upside? And also, as you get bigger, is like, how can I be a positive impact on the space in general? and help basically progress any narratives, whether it be on the mining side with energy companies getting more comfortable around this asset class and realizing this is actually, take the stigma of crypto away. This is actually something that can help your asset. And then just kind of broader crypto of like, if good people are trying to build the right businesses, you can actually create a ton of value. A hundred percent. You know, I think the other like secondary effect of all of that, Asher, was you guys kind of laid out a really cool like scenario and and like oh what's the word i'm trying to think of um case study of like what happens when this market does have a shakeup 
and there are bankruptcies where, you know, maybe those creditors don't want to be running those assets. Who, like what happens? Because we hadn't really seen it at that scale. You guys came in and you provided this really nice playbook and case study of like, here's what happens. People who know what they're doing and, and know how to bring and add the value can come in and pick that up and, and keep things running and, and going. So it's really, it, it was fantastic to see. Um, I it, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious and I can't remember was next era, the, the power company at the site that, that you guys ended up. So like, are you guys working with next era or, or what kind of happened with, with next era and all that, that mix? Yeah, so that's the that's the JV partner um, that we basically acquired the fifty percent mm -hmm. stake in. That's right, yeah. And uh, so I, I have to ask, I, and you know, say what what you you can or maybe you can't talk about it, but I'd love to hear like how is the relationship with them? I mean, they're that it's a is a very large power company, um, and they touch all aspects of power. How's the relationship with them? Um, yeah, so. Look, we have that site, and then we also have the site with Generate and Constellation, right? So we, I think we have two of the largest behind-the-meter sites in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's been good. It's been like what the purpose was that we end up building the site for the next site specifically is a behind-the-meter win project. The whole idea was there's nodal congestion, there's curtailment. And like the thesis has played out, right? We've been able to yeah. help that asset not curtail. We've been able to relieve some of that nodal pressure. and so. I think in general, um, they're happy. Obviously, there's still kind of the, oh, this is crypto, Bitcoin mining, volatility, things of that nature. But um, yeah, I, I think for both kind of energy partners we work with, they're happy with the project. It's operating as it should. Um, it's consuming power as it should. It's paying the bills as it should. And yep. um, yeah, over, over, overall, I think we've built kind of confidence and, and, and trust in, in those two counterparties. That's, that's good to hear. I was there any like rework, you know, I mean, the, these power structures and like the PPAs and, and however you guys structured the, the contracts for the power, like those are usually really big, very complicated, very complex. Was there any rework or back and forth or did you guys just pick it up and, and run with it? Yeah, I mean, uh, so very, it's a long process, right? It's a very long process. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have a we have a full energy team that is in conversations with a lot of different energy partners looking at these assets as we continue to look at other sites and grow and scale. And I mean, it, it, it's not days, it's not months, like it's long months, if not years of like development timing, because if you think about kind of large energy companies, I mean, there's a lot of stakeholders. They need to get comfortable mm -hmm. with this asset cast. They need to get comfortable with the kind of the credit worthiness. I think from an energy perspective, though, the one thing that we say is like, look, like if your site is a merchant site anyways, and you're selling into the grid, if you bring a counterparty to come and consume power, like worst case scenario is you go back to selling into the grid. You're not really taking on much risk compared to just selling into the grid anyways, right? And so, right. Um, so... I think the process is long and you have to be patient and it doesn't, you might get to a point where the company is excited, but the tax equity folks aren't comfortable, right? Or there's so many different kind of tiers of the cap table and who owns a project and, and the site and kind of helps and makes the decisions. And so um, I would say that on the energy asset side, as long as you're patient, I do think that like large scale energy companies will come around the table and we'll understand the value that these create as the assets that already exist, start making, showing a precedent of what this could actually do rather than I think 2021 was a lot of theory of we could do mm -hmm. this at your site. We could build this. This is what it could do to help you. Where now I think you're seeing a lot of these case studies play out and now you can use those to point out, to kind of scale that up. Yeah. You're, you're also highlighting a, a point that, it, it's it's an area that I still have to kind of dig into more, which is like who's on the cap table, like who who is actually involved in these projects for for the power company for them to be able to say yes. Because what I'm learning is it's not as easy for them to just say yes. Like there's a lot of other process and parties involved, 
it's still a learning process for me. You know, it's, I'm still, I'm still learning, you know, how, how these big projects, you know, such as yours get across the finish line and I, because what if I like the next era, they don't like to talk about it. It's, uh, so if anyone from next era is listening, please reach out. Cause I, I would love to ch- just chat with somebody. Yeah, on, look, on that's that why it's like, like we don't share who we partner with honestly, just because like what's public and is out there, I can't control, right? When Computer with one bankrupt, a lot of kind of these names came out and that's yep. something I can control. But I, I think what's what we found is like, there's no need to go and like kind of put folks' names out there and say, we're working with this person or this person and just get folks to be comfortable because as they get more comfortable, they'll tell their friends, the energy world is a small world and then pe- the whole industry will become more comfortable over time. And I think that's the key word like, it takes time, right? This is an industry that basically looks at growth in years and decades. And it's like yeah. the ability to kind of get in alignment and kind of to build that trust and um, to, to build that growth over time. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what I'm finding is it's uh, um, yes, the energy industry, it's very small. <laughs> it's kind of like the Bitcoin mining industry. It's, it's small and, and everybody knows everybody, or at least the, you know, the, the big players all know each other. Um, I'm going to, a little bit of a clunky transition, Asher. I did also want to ask you, you know, HPC, it's getting a lot of buzz. It's getting a lot of attention. Uh, your, your, you know, soon to be merged partner, HUD8, they're very big into the HPC space. Can you maybe touch on, are you guys looking at it? How are you looking at it? Are there some efficiencies to that world you think you guys can bring? Maybe go a little deeper on all that. Yeah. Um, so I think when you think about HTC, you can kind of break it out into a couple of different subsets, right? First and foremost, the energy infrastructure of finding power, dropping down the power and getting it to the shell, which is kind of the building that houses the data center. A lot of that is very similar, right? You add more redundancies, but candidly, when we were building out our Bitcoin mind study, we were looking at putting those redundancies anyways. Cause I'm like, if we're down, it's like the payback is like a month. Why potentially wait nine months to get this equipment again? Like, let's just build the redundancy now, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think from like the electrical side, we've done a really good job as a company, like originating, finding, building, scaling, driving costs down, driving time down. Um, and from kind of the conversations we've had is there's a lot of similarities um, and it's something we understand really well. Um, and then you kind of get to the core data center itself. So obviously HUT has five data, HUT has five mm-hmm. data centers. They're operating, they're managing. And as the world continues to evolve and there's all this demand on kind of NVIDIA chips and the growth in AI and the growth in GPU servers, I think there's going to be, I mean, it's not, I think this is pretty public where there's just a massive kind of shortage and a lot of growth happening in the data center world, right? People are building data centers left and right. All these publicly traded REITs are scaling, they're growing. And so I think the ability to continue kind of to grow that business and to scale that business, scale that knowledge base there. And then when you kind of look at the AI vertical specifically, because when you think about a data center, it's not just AI, right? You have every use case that you could think of that you put into that data center um, and you run that compute. And then you have kind of the AI compute and like the core weave guys have done an amazing job and kind of mm-hmm. starting as an Ethereum miner and pivoting into the AI world and kind of being at the, the center there and kind of getting the massive scale and success that they have this year. But um, basically being able to run these super pods to run some of these training models and eventually get into inference. And so when we look at kind of the ecosystem, we think there's a lot of opportunity. We think we have strengths um, in specific areas where we have competitive advantages. And so in a post amalgamated world is continue to build and continue to kind of focus on the areas that we believe we have strengths in and to compete and scale. Yeah, it's the, the scale, but I, I think one of the things that's, you know, maybe not talked about as much is I think that the, and, and maybe you can chime in and, and tell me if I'm thinking about this right, is that I think that the data center world is looking at the Bitcoin mining space and seeing how much the cost can be driven down and still run an effective data center. I, I mean, I think last time I looked, it was like dollars per megawatt to build a traditional data center is like, I thought, I thought it was, and I, 
I talked to a gentleman who I think shared this figure with me. It was like eight million dollars per megawatt that's to right. build yeah, a like traditional eight, data center. First tier three, tier four. That's right. And I think you can see, you know, Bitcoin mining companies spin up eight, eight hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars per megawatt. I mean, that is a gigantic. Well, we built for around three hundred, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, the I think the the bigger story that's not quite talked about as much yet is is i think they're watching and saying oh wow we can really drive these costs down yeah and I, look there's a balance right there's a lot of things that go into a traditional data center i mean everything from like cooling to redundancy to generator backup to you um that just doesn't exist in bitcoin mining data centers and so there i think there is room to be more efficient but the actual data center itself is very different um i think furthermore like it, if you think about kind of the chip itself, like think about a megawatt of miners is, I don't know, roughly call it 300, 330 machines, right? Um, and in today's market, that's what, 300 grand, maybe three to 600 grand, depending on what machines you get and whatnot. And yeah. so in a world where basically, instead of paying one to kind of 2000 bucks a machine, you were paying $10,000 a machine, everyone started saying, I'm going to go and buy immersion. I'm going to protect, I'm going to pay more for infrastructure. I'm going to protect my miners and so forth. Right. Right now, everyone's like, oh, it's fine. Like these machines, like put them in force here. Well, we can, it, it's not worth the cost of building that more expensive infrastructure. If you think about like a NVIDIA H100 cluster, I mean, if you look at like a megawatt or a megawatt and a half, you're talking like $50 million, right? On that, on that chip. Shit. And so- <laughs> Spending a bit more on the infrastructure to protect that investment makes sense. And so I think that's like something to weigh and really understand is the the ultimate data center is to house like that chip. And the higher value that chip is, the more you're going to spend to make sure that that data center is yeah. protected, right? Um, and so that that's just kind of a couple, a couple high level numbers to kind of put into perspective. And I appreciate that because I didn't know that that was the cost. Um, it's going to be really fun. Soon after our episode goes live, I'll, I'll have one with Taylor Monig at CleanSpark. And he, he's doing a lot of cool work in immersion. So I'm going to get to pick his brain. And you know, I, it'll be interesting to see if we get into like what you just said is like chip protection and, you know, lifespan yeah. and, and all of that is the focus. So that's, I appreciate you, you mentioning that. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> Um, another thing too, is if you think about like traditional data centers, I mean, the breaker rate, because of how the infrastructure is built, the machines break way less often than mining machines, right? Because they're way less accessible to the environments. And so that, um, I think that's a whole nother element as well. It's just, look, I think there's a lot of overlap to mining. There's a lot of differences as well. And it like the idea of, Hey, we mine Bitcoin and now we can just go do this whole new sector. I think that's not accurate. But similarly, when Bitcoin first started and we were in 21 of, hey, a lot of companies are saying we're going to go scale, we're going to do this. There will be players that succeed and are able to transition and grow that competency. And there will be folks that will have execution risk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see, you know, what I guess, you know, how the, the traditional data center world and, and the Bitcoin mining data centers uh, and. HPC and how that all kind of converges as far as like build out and, and operational efficiencies and things like that. Um, Asher, I, I know you guys, you probably, well, not probably, I know you talk about this a lot. You guys have a big merge coming up and, and that's front and center and probably all you guys talk about. Could you maybe touch on how things are going and, you know, just maybe touch on the, the merger? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Kind of earlier in the year, the beginning of the year, we signed and announced a merger with a company called HUD8. Uh, they're, list, they're a Canadian company in Toronto, listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. They're dual listed. So when they did the merger, we decided to re-domicile the company in the U.S. Um, in our Miami headquarters. And so as a part of doing that, it meant basically, one, we had to merge. So in Canada, because they're a Canadian company, we needed court approval, we needed our shareholders to approve. And two, because we're re on the company to a US listed company, we have to go through the SEC and S4 uh, process. And so the Canadian courts had approved of the deal. We got kind of Glass-Lewis approval. We got all kind of the third parties to support the deal. How did have their public shareholder vote? I think it was 
97% or plus in favor of the transaction uh, of the votes of the folks that voted. And so right now we're just waiting for final kind of um, SEC approval to get through the process uh, with the S4 and everyone can see it's pretty public. You can go and look up the S4 and kind of the recent updates and drafts that we submit publicly. And we're going to go through that process. And then after that process, we'll have to go through a shareholder vote on our side. Um, but yeah, been, been going through the process. I think we've both been kind of building our businesses in, in, in the interim. And obviously we've had a lot of awesome opportunities and abilities to scale in this last year. And so um, I think what the merger kind of provides for both parties is I think on our side, it's the ability to kind of be public, have access to the capital markets, um, have the balance sheet that they have to continue to drive the growth and scale that we've seen. And I, and I think on their side, it's really kind of, again, the team and the operational excellence and mm -hmm. the um, the operational business that we've built today. And I think on their side, um, they've obviously had some struggles on the mining side. And so being able to bring that team, it's really like a yin and yang and to come together yeah. and really build and grow a great business together. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of really, really, really good synergies um, between you guys. So it's I was excited when I saw the announcement. I'm excited to hear you know things are are going well. Um, you know, it kind of sounds a little bit to me like um, maybe kind of the the bankruptcy acquisitions that you guys where it's like, well, I don't know, but we're gonna figure this thing. Like it just sounds like a ton of moving pieces, not only to merge but to redomicile and just. I'm not a finance right. guy either, yeah, so you know, for me, it's, it's like, it's, whoa. It's not much sweeter when it's harder to get to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, Asher, to keep a, a pulse on the time, um, I, I would love to hear if you could talk about, like, what what does, you know, future look like? And I know that that's a little bit complicated in the midst of the merger, but would love if you can shed some light on you know, what is, what does the future look like? Yeah. So I've gone in good training around what I can say forward looking <laughs> and not as we go through this yeah, merger yeah. process. But look, I think for us, it's, it's always been, how do we build a great business that is rooted in its fundamentals and is able to do the right things, work with the right folks and just be a good partner and be a good executor, be a good kind of fiduciary of capital for our shareholders. And so on our side, we're going to continue to look at finding the right ways to scale, continue to diversify our business, but give kind of upside exposure for different times in the market. And the goal is at any point in the market, how do we make sure that we're a strong business that is able to produce returns relative to the peers at that moment in time? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that means growth in our kind of core business today, which is every, everything mining, whether it be self-mining, property management, servicing, co-location, um, and kind of growth, growth all around there. And then the second is obviously on HUD and kind of their data centers and, and that deployment and, and the growing kind of sector there. So I think continued kind of just keeping our heads down and continue to chop wood and, um, and put in kind of the good fight. I appreciate that. I'll, uh, so I will circle back with you once you, Mike and Jamie get this thing across the finish line, and then we'll have a, a big gangbuster podcast episode about uh, the, the future and the trajectory and everything you guys are working on. Cause I know it's a lot of cool stuff. I know that, uh, you do have to be careful on how you present it. So we'll, we'll, we'll circle back once you guys get it across the finish line. That'll be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We'd love to. Yeah. So Asher, I'd love to, to have you kind of give a plug or a handoff to the audience, uh, be that, uh, so that they can get in touch with yourself or us Bitcoin core at large, uh, please, you know, share with the audience how they can connect with you. Yeah, I mean, honestly, easiest is unconventional. It's probably email, right? It's just asher at usbitcoin.com. Um, I do have a Twitter, it's Asher, you know, just my first and last name uh, that I've started to use a lot more often now with the Celsius transaction because a lot of the audience face <laughs> is on Twitter. But yeah, easiest way is shoot me an email and happy to connect with anyone. Great. We'll, we'll link to everything in the show notes as well. Asher, you've You've been very gracious with your time. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I, I love the, you know, the 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 interest for you was the the power side of this. That uh, it's the same for me. So this this was fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, most definitely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, take care.